I this to see uh, pathophysiology of LDS, there is everything. There is physiology, there is... Uh, well, I think that uh, when LDS has been said, we are accustomed to see this kind of picture. However, a lot of studies that we did, when we did over three decades, they put together a patient like this, a patient with far less severe RDS. But what dictates the severity of RDS? We have an insult and we have the reaction of the body. And the reaction is the edema. ARDS basically is inflammatory pulmonary edema. Inflammatory, what's about the hemodynamics? There is always, always, in most of the cases, we have some overlap of hydrostatic edema. And if you think how we treat the patient, let's see, come a patient with a pneumonia, with a sepsis, you take a book, what you have to do? First, you give five liters, my God. Our blood uh, is no more than four or five liters. We give in two hours an amount uh, of fluid similar to the amount of blood. And very rarely the people ask themselves how much, go, where the fluid goes. The purpose should be to put the fluids in the vessels. On five liters of crystal loss, how much get in the vessels? If it's not in the vessel, in extra cellular water, of course. But if you make some computation, the sodium maybe should rise uh, at 170, 180. That means that a lot of fluid goes into the cells. And the barrier of the cells, they to, to take a sodium and throw away the sodium. And so at the end, we put these five liters, which goes also into the lamp or in chemo, and we have a beautiful picture, which uh, is uh, at the end where there is edema at different degrees of extent. You may have an edema which is 50% of the lung weight, 100% of the lung weight, 200% of the lung weight. And more or less, after 30 years, we know that this amount of edema is related to the degree of impairment of oxygenation. We are very well defended about the oxygenation decrease. If you have an edema taking 20%, 40%, 50% of the lung, still the shunt is around 20, 25, because we still have uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction. But when edema is a 60, 70, you may have uh, a real uh, impairment. So to anticipate the final, I think that the actual classification with RDS uh, is not bad at all. That means mild RDS is not RDS, forget it. Send it to, no, no, not home, but uh, forget, it's not RDS. Then we have moderate RDS, under 200. 70% of the patients with RDS are in that group, which is too wide. If you look in this group, when the PF is below 150, you start to have a consistent sign of edema. And severe RDS is what is Baug called RDS. That means a condition with refractory hypoxemia. Now you go around the world and say, conference saying, ah, refractory hypoxemia. What is refractory hypoxemia? We have to define refractory hypoxemia. It has been defined by those Baug. 40 years ago, maybe maybe more than 40 years ago, was a refractory to what? To oxygen. That means even providing 100% oxygen, you cannot have a normal PO2. This is refractory hypoxemia. Very easy. When you don't have normal PO2 with 100% oxygen, means that the shunt is at least 33% of the cardiac output. Are quite simple rules. So I would like to concentrate more on moderate severe and severe RDS. For what all the advances we did in the last years are, the, are concentrated in this group of patients. CT, I think the CT 
helped us to understand a lot about uh, the basic pathophysiology. The CT is mass uh, divide volume, and the volume is the mass. Mass in the CT is whatever is liquid or solid. And the rest uh, of the volume is provided by gas. So this, uh, the density is measured by the CT quite accurately. And so we know at each uh, voxel how much is, uh, we can, we may know how much is the, the gas uh, and how much is uh, the tissue, including in the tissue, the rim, the blood, uh, the cells, etc., uh, etc., et whatever is uh, solid. Now, one uh, of the classical things, we did this graph, I think, about 30 years ago, and now there is a big discussion. <coughs> there are few works saying, okay, we were calling a threshold of minus 100 to mi plus 100, we were calling non-inflated tissue. Now, what means minus 100? Minus 100 means that you, you count, you take all the voxels, and you count how much is the gas and the vo and the, ma uh, the gas and the solid into the volume. If it's zero, you are in this area below zero. That means all the pulmonary units are completely degassed. If minus 100, there is a little gas, maybe as maximum as 10%, which accounts for the gas which is left behind when we have the peripheral way collapse. And this is the part of the tissue which, if the PIP is not adequate, makes gymnastics open and close, which apparently is one of the problem of the RDS. Now there are people say, okay, why not you use 200 or to use 400 or 300? You can use whatever you want. It depends, you should know what you are doing. If you use 500, you know that you include part of the units which have up to 50% of inflation. So are open even at zip easily. And now there is the mystery here. Because we, when, when we proposed this threshold, we were looking without any statistic or mathematics. We were looking 11 normal subjects, including myself, uh, and, and we draw this line. And we say, okay, the, these are the RDS patients, and we say, uh, there is a part of the lung which is uh, resembled the normal lung, okay, called normal inflated tissue. And there was some report on emphysema patients saying these are hyperinflated tissue. Greater than 900, that means we have one unit of tissue, 90% of gases. Now, in RDS, how many times you have seen uh, or have heard uh, there is the hyperinflation? Great. Now, try to look at a CT scan and show me where and when you have hyperinflation. Define it in this way. But of course, if the mass is double, how can I reach minus 900? of Hounsfield units. This is never considered. With a CT scan, it's extremely difficult to find hyperinflation. You can find only hyperinflation in a mild RDS. When most of the lung is normal, if you apply pressure enough, you can go in this area. But try to show me one severe RDS with hyperinflation categorized by the CT scan. And the CT scan tell you which are the discriminant units. How much tissue is in one voxel? With the CT scan that we use now, in which the, the voxel we use now, the ever and volume is about 0 0.002 milli, uh, millimeters uh, at the third power, we may have uh, some as four to five uh, units acidine completely collapsed, or if you have a normal lung with a complete expansion, you have about 20 to 30 alveoli. We must have some idea when we see black and white on what we are talking about. 
we have our box, which is a unit. Inside of the box, we may have different things. Edema, part of the lung. But this, I, I think, to have an idea of the discriminant power of the voxels is quite important. I think when we start uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, to having the anatomy of uh, in vivo anatomy with uh, the membrane lung, uh, we start to compare the with the physiological variables. I think the most important thing at that time was this one. When you start to say, okay, look at the compliance. And when we plot the compliance versus the non inflated tissue, which is the amount of the tissue, which is uh, edema, maybe half a kilo, one kilo, one kilo and half half, we could not find any relationship. And this was very disappointing. <laughs> and took us a few months uh, to think that when we measure the compliance, we measure the good lung and not the bad lung. We put the gas where the lung is already open. And maybe we may recruit some. Don't over-evaluate the recruitment. Recruitment is not 100% of the lung. It's about 10% of the lung tissue. Exceptionally, maybe up to 30%, 40%, but not, not much more. And when we plot the tissue versus the Compliance, uh, what we found, uh, uh, and it's still true, that we have uh, some decent, not perfect, decent relationship between the compliance uh, and the amount uh, of normal lung. Now, if you have a pneumonectomy, if you have a uh, lung, residual lung, the compliance around 40, 50, is a quite uh, a rule of thumb, when we have a compliance of 20, respiratory system compliance, unless you don't have a terrible chest wall abnormalities, you may say that the ventilatable lung is about 20% of what it should be. If you have 60 of compliance, you have 60 of the lung open to ventilation. So the ventilatory problem goes down, 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 because uh, to in a normal, in pneumectomy, we can ventilate the patient uh, not very complicated with 50% of compliance. So the compliance give you the first idea on how much is the material available ventilation. And of course, if I use 500 milliliters and my normal lung is 2.5, the ratio, which is how much the lung is strained uh, is one to five, it's zero to two. This is a normal ratio. If I have one, uh, that means that each breath I double my lung volume, it's still good. I expect disaster one to one. No, our lung perfectly tolerate to one to one ratio. When we start to have a problems, when you have a ratio greater than two, two, 2.5. And you say, my God, but how is possible that we can reach a so high ratio? Is impossible usually in the normal ventilation, but is possibly regionally into the lung. Because the lung does not inflate homogeneously. But part of the lung may undergo and stretch a stress uh, which is greater than other part of the lung. At the CT scan, these are masked by the presence of edema. Remember, the edema is part uh, of the density. If I have double mass, it's difficult to say. So, let's see what's how the lung uh, is made for what we know now. But I will concentrate more at the end. We at the beginning thought that the baby lung was uh, black up in the non-dependent regions of the lung. So putting the patient in prone position, we perfuse the baby lung, everybody's happy. PO2 goes up. And then we saw that uh, when we put the patient in prone position, the density goes down. So the baby lung disappears. The baby lung is an, a functional concept because all the lung appear. I'm speaking about moderate, severe, and severe RDS. 
Sivir clearly is true. All the land is full of edema. And of course, uh, the gravitational forces tends to compress uh, the dependent regions of the lung. When you put in prone position, you reverse. And when you apply PEEP, you have to apply a PEEP. If you want to keep this one open, if it's openable, you have to provide a pressure which is at least enough to the compressive forces, plus the pressure to lift up the thorax. So at the end of the story, when you have a gas exchange, severe RDS, you know that the edema is at least uh, greater than 50-70% of the lung weight. You look at the compliance, you have an idea of how much lung uh, is ventilatable. You know what's happened when you put this patient in prone position, that you reverse, uh, as you have more lung in the back than in the front, uh, you have greater opening than closing in the anterior part, and the oxygenation improves. So we have a sort of big sponge which take water everywhere and which is compressing the dependent regions just because. And this model still explain the PEEP, still explain the prone position response. But it's difficult to explain how much the strain may be dangerous. How can I reach locally very high stress and strain? This is a rear sponge, uh, took, uh, uh, works with the CT scan with the rear sponge. And I think in the last 10 minutes, I would like to concentrate a little bit on uh, when we have a patient in front of us and we imagine how the lung are made. You have, I think, to think uh, to a very complex picture, which is not homogeneous. Homogeneous is what means. Homogeneous means the same characteristics in every part. The lung does is not homogeneous, even the natural lung. But the disease of lung uh, is completely not homogeneous. And the shape also play a role. Did you ask yourself why, as an example, in the patient uh, with your PD or physema, the bubbles develops up and not down? Without, you have more ventilation. Why we start up? And this has to do also with the shape of the lung. If I had to break part of the this one, where I break if I apply forces here? These are the force line concentration. Here, any times we have the angles, you have some concentration of the force. If for the same force applied locally, I have uh, something worse happening. And this is a, a paper of Mead. He was a physiologist. I suggest uh, you not to read it. If you all read it, forget it. It's a waste of time. If you want to study, it's a different. If you want to study, it takes at least one month to read, reread, to compare with other books, and then to rethink and go back. If not, it's a waste of time. But if I had to simplify for what I understood of this paper, let's see if I have, uh, let's see, one weight, one kilo, which is suspended by three cords. And the cords are the extracellular matrix, which bears all the forces applied. My load, one kilo, let's see, is the, my load and the mechanical ventilation, my energy load. If I have three cords, uh, each cord takes uh, 333 period, three grams, right? Now I cut one cord. The two remaining cords take uh, half a kilo. The load I read on the ventilator is still 30. Now I cut another cord. The remaining cord uh, have to wait uh, to support uh, one kilo. So not homogeneous means that in part of the lung the energy load is increased. In other part of the lung the energy load is decreased or even zero. The bad part of the lung never opened. Uh, is protected by the ventilation. 
when we induce damages, we induce damages in the open lung. And uh, these are an homogeneity. And you see this is healthy lung. We use a color code, uh, and we look at uh, how we measure the homogeneity. We say, okay, let's see, if I have uh, three units, one is 0, 07, 0, 07, 0, 07, that means the density is 0, 07, means 70% uh, gas and 30% uh, tissue. If are all 0, 07, that means that the forces applied on this piece uh, are the same because they are distended the same. But if I add 0, 02, 0, 07, 0, 02, so what's happened? or the alveolus destroyed, or have some uneven distribution of forces. So we went to look at all the lumpar in chemo to see how, which were the limits of normal homogeneity versus the homogeneity we could find here. And you see here in red, all the white here is homogeneous. It's the same. But the interface, we have uh, these pieces looking severe the DS. All this blue is out of business. This one, yeah. when you have this, oh, this homogeneity, your pressure, maybe we found that you can multiply as average as two, maximum three times, not 10 times. But that means if I apply 10 centimeter of water or transpulmonary pressure, I got 20 locally. 20, I enter in the total lung capacity the maximum stretch that the lung may support. And if I take an animal, I ventilate for uh, 24 hours in that way, I kill the lungs of the animals. And uh, where this happens, the dishomogeneity. Look as an example, this is the visceral pleura. And here are the alveoli, the suppleural alveoli. The visceral pleura, the elasticity, is about one-third. So 60% less than the elasticity of these uh, components. When I apply a force, uh, this is an engineer computation, very complicated, just to tell you very simply, that if I have to break sound, uh, very, very probably I will break at the interfaces here. Now, what we found in animals, and this was quite a big surprise, when you start to make a ventilation, a little ventilation, even with 2.5, the amount of, let's see, 300 milliliters of uh, FRC, ventilated for 900, nothing happened for four or five hours. Then after five hours, you start to have uh, some lesion. Where? The lesions are all around the visceral pleura. And then from there become inhomogeneity and they spread all around the lung. And now just give me the last <coughs> three or four slides. Oh no, I, I forgot to count two minutes. Just three, uh, last few slides. In here, this is an inflation uh, signal when you see the scan. This is homogeneity. Hmm? That was developed mainly by Dr. Cressoni. And this is the PET signal. So it's possible to put together all this signal and to see how the ARDS is. The ARDS uh, lung is, so how much is this homogeneity? This homogeneity do present an increase in metabolic activity. The baby lung is metabolically active uh, of inert and so on. Eh? So we put together, we, we have a different condition. One condition is, is lung is homogeneous, not inflamed. Homogeneous, not inflamed. That means it's perfectly normal. Let's call white. Then we have it not homogeneous, inflamed. Let's put red. <coughs> this is homogeneous, inflamed. So with a big captation, captation let me call inflamed, uh, you may discuss. Uh, or you have not homogeneous, not inflamed. And this is 
mild an example, but very consistent, an example of mild RDS, white. And you see that uh, the red is at the interface. You have a part here which is not inflamed, and uh, this part uh, is more or less closed. Now, to me, it's difficult to call it RDS because this part of the lung is perfectly normal, the white. So you can ventilate this lung without any problem. Then we have moderate RDS. Moderate RDS between 100 and 150. And you see that uh, you may have how the not homogeneous is the lung, how the patch is different. But you still have part of the baby lung, which is not only inflated, is also non-inflamed. That means it's reduced, even reduced compared to the bilan, just judge it about the inflation. <coughs> but you know, in this you have a problem. But my dear friends, what can we do in severe RDS? In severe RDS, the baby land disappeared. So I think we have to start to look at each patient different. First thing to do before to play with the ventilator is try to understand if my, the lungs of the patient are more in this category or this or the, of course there is a continuum. But there are extreme from here to here. And at the end of the story, I know how much is my ventilable lung because all these numbers at the end of the story come together. And come together and the lung protective strategy is nothing less than less energy and to make the lung more homogeneous. More homogeneous means peep and proposition, that's it. And uh, I think this still is an helpful table because at uh, this mild, moderate, and severe, which we put uh, just looking at the, looking at the PF, eh, we found that many other components which design the severity are included in this. And as you can see, all the therapy, therapy, all the symptomatic therapy of uh, the ventilation, which is not the cure of the disease, is the buying time, uh, waiting the antibiotics, uh, the anti-inflammatory, the antibodies works, uh, are concentrated uh, between uh, moderate severe and severe RDS. And H of now is a devil, but believe me, wait. In 10, 20 years, uh, it will be resuscitated. Thank you for the attention.